This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 292 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. Healthy Stable Design. And 2014 World Champion Jim Anderson's Road to the Horse. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. And today's Stable Scoop is sponsored by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find them online at KPP USA and listeners like you. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the stable, it's every week. They bring you the news through hay or high water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. So sit on down and laugh till your poop, cause it's time again for Stable School. Stable School. Stable School. This is Helena B. And this is Coach Jen. And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Hello, Coach Jen. Hi, ho. You know, um, Jen and I don't get to host Stable Scoop together very often, but it's not like this is the only time we talk. We had like an hour and a half conversation yesterday about... I don't know, what, cantering and martingales? And- <laughs> I, I love it when you're stuck in the car. <laughs> when you're in traffic, it's awesome. <laughs> I wasn't stuck in the car. I was on my way home. F- I don't know where I was. I was in the car, but I wasn't stuck in the car. Sometimes, though, I get in the car just because I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's 13 miles to the grocery store. I can go pick up some milk. There you go. <laughs> and ask Jen why my horse is falling out behind at the canter. There you go. How are you? I'm doing great. It's nice to hang out with you again. We, we're going to have fun. I know. I know. We have um, John Blackburn, one of my favorite people in the horse world of Blackburn Architects. And he's going to talk about his new book called Healthy Stables by Design. And um, it's a book about, well, his principles, his philosophy of designing equestrian stables that are focused on the health and safety of the horse. And that's kind of different than our traditional stable design. Well, and and it's interesting because, of course, you have to go to Amazon right away and look it up. And um, I I hesitate to call this a coffee table book because it is chock full of relevant information, but it's beautiful. Well, everything John Blackburn does is beautiful. He's an incredibly talented guy. He's really likable, too. He, this is a man who's been doing uh, his job. He's been designing stables for the better part of 30 years, and he absolutely loves it. And he has so many opportunities to create very diverse kinds of stables. Mm-hmm. And this will come out in um, as you listen to our conversation with him. But the book, uh, it definitely reflects his design aesthetic. It, mm-hmm. it, it it's practical and my goodness, it's gorgeous. Yes. I want the book just because I want to stare at the pictures for a long time. <laughs> but then the problem is I'm going to start doodling and make, oh, yeah, I know what's going to happen then. I know. I can yeah. see it. my copy is going to have like little yellow post-it notes on all the pages of the things I want to incorporate into my next barn design. But I, I can, I understand <laughs> your suspicion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, also later in the show to add a little international flair, We're going to hear the interview that Glenn and Tammy Sarunz did with Jim Anderson, who just won the 2014 Road to the Horse competition. And Glenn was there along with Tammy, so we're going to hear it from uh, two people who attended as well as the winner. And he's chock full of information, so that's going to be a a nice full stable scoop. That'll fill it right up. It's a full scoop, Helena. (laughs) It's a full scoop. It's a full scoop. But before the show does get underway, we're going to take a quick minute to hear from one of our sponsors. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. The horse that matters to you matters to Kentucky Performance Products. Feeding your horse starch-laden grains can lead to colic, laminitis, and metabolic disease. 
Today, nutritionists are recommending the use of high-quality fat to provide healthy calories. Fat is an extraordinary energy source. It's readily utilized by the horse and contains more than two times the calories of starchy grains. Replacing grain with a high-quality fat supplement reduces a horse's risk of developing health problems. Equijoule Stabilized Rice Bran is an excellent fat supplement. It contains a balanced calcium to phosphorus ratio and won't cause mineral imbalances when added to the diet. Its all-natural ingredients are high in healthy fat and fiber. And best of all, horses fueled by Equijoule stay calmer and more focused on the job at hand. When you need to add healthy calories to your horse's diet, choose Equijoule. To learn more, visit Kentucky Performance Products at kppusa.com. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Up next, we have John Blackburn of Blackburn Architects. John's going to talk to us about his new book, Healthy Stables by Design, which is a common sense approach to the health and safety of horses, of course, when it comes to designing barns. John was on uh, Stable Scoop uh, quite a few years ago, 2009. He was one, it was episode 33. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, just, uh, he be, had became instant rock star to me. And um, we talked about how his stable designs focus on the concept of aerodynamic ventilation, strategic na- natural light solar heating and cooling. And when it finally came time for me to do my own barn, I actually incorporated several of the principles that we talked about in that interview into my own barn. And I'm so glad I did. This guy really knows his stuff. So I'm excited that he's back with some some more new and exciting things. And a book. A gorgeous book. Let's go to it. Welcome back, John, to the Stable Scoop Radio Show. I'm here with Coach Jen today, and we're two barn geeks, and we're really happy to have you back to talk about your new book, Healthy Stables by Design, A Common well, Sense Approach to the Health and Safety of Horses. Well, great. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to uh, talk about it. We had you on Stable Scoop, um, geez, a few years ago now. It was back in 2009, and I was thrilled to hear about your ideas and your sp- perspectives about barn design. And when it came time to build my own barn in 2010, I actually incorporated some very specific features that we discussed on the show, um, one of which was vents in the bottom front of my my stall fronts to help with with airflow. So, uh, you know, it's amazing how a a conversation about barn design can really stick with you and, and how it can change the way you manage your stable and horse care. What prompted you to come up with this new book? Uh, well, what prompted me to come up with the book was I'd been doing the, um, this design approach or taking this design approach uh, for 30 years, and people have mentioned over the years about uh, putting my ideas and my thoughts into a book. And um, actually, after completing so many projects and uh, and the recession was hitting me, so I thought, well, I've got uh, been putting off this book for all this time. Let me take the downtime and use that to write a book. Uh, after doing it for 30 years, I had a lot to say. And then my first dilemma was, do I make it a more of a technical book or more of a coffee table book? And I did want to do it just a coffee table book. And there are a lot of books out there on barns with nice photographs of barns. What I want to do is uh, talk about my designs, my different designs, and how they differ, but then what brings them together and makes them unique, uh, or each unique or all sort of similar in many respects, even though they look quite different and they're in different locations of the country. So I decided to write this book focused on 14 of my projects, uh, all very different, but they come together with one unifying thought, and that's about the natural light, natural ventilation, and designing for the health of the horse. Every one of the farms in the book, of which there are 14, are all very different. They look very different. They have different types of budgets. They range from all types of our green barns from fairly fairly low budgets to very expensive barns. But they're all the each barn is just as healthy as the other. And so I took the time to write the book and that's what I've been doing. I've been promoting the book and I've also decided all the office profits from the book or proceeds from the book, not profits but just any proceeds from the book, go to horse charities because I as I said, I said before, 
horses have been uh, feeding me for 30 years. It's time for me to feed the horses. <laughs> that's a loaded statement. <laughs> Cause you, right. That's a loaded statement. You, um, do you have horses yourself right now? No, I do not. I do not. I grew up around horses. I uh, had a twin sister who rode. I played in the barn. And so it's probably more appropriate that I write about barns and not horsemanship. Well, it's easy to love the concept of a barn, to be inside of it, to design it, to play in it, to just spend time in it um, without right. actually right, owning or riding horses. Because I, I know, Jen, you and I share that. Um, there's a love for the barn. A lot of horse people do. They share that love for the barn itself. Right. And I've had a bumper sticker on my car that says, happiness is in the barn. <laughs> and so, and I have played in the barn. I know the, uh, I've, and of course I've learned everything about uh, handling of horses over the years. Uh, I do sort of grew up with it to some degree, though I didn't focus on it purposely for this uh, career goal. It sort of fell in my lap, and I, uh, I've been running with it, as I said, for 30 years. So what kind it's been of... a great ride. What kind of person or property owner, horse owner, contacts you to design a barn? Um, is there a, you know, a general type of person who does that, or is it varied? It's the person who has the genuine concern for the health and safety of their horse. And I have described it before that there are basically uh, four values for a horse. You can have the value in the, what you paid for the horse. You can have value, and you want to protect that value, whatever you do. But you have a value in the uh, in purchase of the horse. You have the value in your training for the horse. You have your value in the upkeep of that horse. But quite frankly, some of the most expensive or big, greatest value is the emotional value you have for the horse. You want to protect that horse. It's part of you. It's part. It's your best friend in many cases. It's part of your family, and uh, and you so you want to protect that that horse and its health and safety. So, people who contact me, that's generally the reason they're coming to me because they they've recognized that the health and safety and it depends on natural light, natural ventilation, and all the other uh, details you incorporate into planning and designing a, a farm is protective of that horse and that's what they have as a major concern and that's what attracts them to me because I've been doing this for my first barn in 1983 was focusing natural light and natural ventilation and uh, it's it, it's fairly it's fairly unique at that time it's been copied a lot I've done it uh, I've done over 160 farms I've incorporated that and in some value of that in every almost every case so um that's what I focus on, and that's why people come to me. Actually, when I first got started publishing, I started writing uh, articles for the horse, which is about the health and safety of horses. And so it was very ap apropos for me, and the people who subscribed or read that magazine were obviously focused on the health and safety of horses. And so it sort of became a, uh, a unique bond from the very beginning, and I've uh, been pursuing that for for the 30 years now. So, John, since you started designing bars in the 1980s, as far as um, things that make a barn healthy for the animals to live in versus designs that are there aesthetically, has what your customers desire changed? In other words, since the 80s compared to 2014, the, the aspects of the barn that really directly impact the horse's health. Has that changed? Has you, have you seen that uh, morph at all since the 1980s? Uh, not from my perspective in terms of the health and safety. The natural light, in other words, I describe it as this, is that a horse is meant to live in nature, and it controls its environment. It's a, it's a, its defense mechanism is flight. So if it needs to change its environment, whether it's threatened, whether it's too much sun, too, too cold, whatever, it can then control its environment to protect its health. And when you take a horse out of its natural habitat, you put it into a, a paddock and even worse, into a barn, which, by the way, a barn is uh, one of the last places you actually should put a horse, is, is once you put it in that environment, it, uh, it's at risk for disease, for injury, and you have to design that barn for to protect the health and safety of the horse. In other words... I, I always say that the inside of the barn should be close to the temperatures of the on the outside, eight to ten degrees within eight to ten degrees of the exterior temperature. 
So you don't want to heat the barn. You don't want to air condition the barn, at least the horse areas. And so uh, I try to keep it natural, but for the same reason a horse wants to run out of the sun, it gets un- runs under a tree, you need to get the horse in the shade, be able to keep it in the shade or keep it out of the sun. Gives it those options. If it wants to get in the wind, it can run up on top of a hill where it can pick up a breeze or it can run behind a hill. And the same in a stall, you may have natural ventilation, but you may actually have a fan, but you allow that fan to, to focus on one portion of the stall so the horse has the option of moving in front of the fan or out of the fan, once again, to control its environment. And so if you have an enclosed environment such as a barn and you don't ventilate it, you can get bacteria breeding, you get odors to breed from darkness and dampness, you can have uh, bacteria from one horse transports to another horse, So my goal has been to bring air in low and ventilate it out high near the ridge and uh, use the shape of the barn uh, to help help create that uh, effect. And basically you take what is a static building and you turn it into a machine, which is basically a natural light and ventilating machine by using natural and and, and, um, simple design features like skylights, venting down low that that you can close and control or venting up high at the ease, which is above the horse, so it's a dissimilar uh, situation if a horse wants to get behind a hill. It's no longer in the breeze, but it's out of it's it's not in a heated space either. So it's also more like nature, and so that's what the barn has to do. It has to duplicate all the options uh, that the horse can uh, make the decisions it can make for itself when it's in in the, in the wild. So, so if, go ahead, go ahead. Karina. It's your turn. I asked the last question. I know, I know. I'm getting really excited. The um, well, one of the things I notice is that when I keep my horse at home, he has the opportunity to go in and out at at will. So, like you said, he has the, the opportunity to control his environment. Right. Um, but not all horses do that. So, if you, um, how do you balance the the design, uh, the health and safety? incorporate into design of the inside of the barn with the horse and give the opportunity to the horse to go out. Like our, do you make well, we that do, suggestion like to have in and outs? We do connect uh, stalls to an outside, a little outside turnout. Um, uh, it, and, and as you said earlier in the 1980s, we didn't do that much. Uh, we started out with thoroughbred farms and that was not um, something that was of concern to them. But as you get more into the, uh, sport horses and the private horses, and the, uh, then they want to have their horses that uh, have less labor, and so they like to have their horses that have the freedom of moving in and out, which is great. But you know, a horse, a uh, little, you, you know yourself probably from seeing a, a horse out in the pad, paddock, and there's a run-in shed, and it's pouring down rain, and where will that horse sometimes stand? Right in front of that run-in shed, <laughs> but out in the rain. So it has its, its own choice. It's and true. And that's the nice thing about a barn with a turnout is that the horse can go in and out. It can socialize with its friends. It can it can uh, pick up the wind or the sun, and it can move back into the stall. And I think that's a nice uh, option. I think any, the more you can give its freedom, at the same time that you protect its health and its its value, that's the that's the optimum goal. Oh, it's my turn now. Yeah, so. Yeah. I see in your book that you have examples of barns from all across the United States. Yes. And that got me to thinking because having lived in a number of different states now, um, architecture is a traditional thing. You see barn architecture that was brought over from whatever ethnic group settled that area. Right. Post-Civil War for the most part. So... In you, in, from your point of view, is that barn design in different geographic areas of the United States? It's a very large place with a lot of different um, weather patterns and, and yes. things. Is that still defined by culture, or are you, or is it now in this day and age defined by the geography and the weather patterns of that particular part of the country? For example, in Southern California, are they still building barns? because of the Spanish and Mexican heritage, or are they now building barns because it needs to be built this way because we're in Southern California? Well, you've hit on a unique key of my book that I try to focus on. Is how do you, in other words, the barn that you design, design for in South Texas 
is going to be different than the barn you designed for the upper peninsula of Michigan, just yeah. because the environment's <laughs> very different. But you are still designed for the health and safety of that horse, and so it, it may have some impact on how you uh, introduce natural light and natural ventilation, but the basic concern for the health and safety of the horse is the same, and you, you respond a little bit differently in each location. And the actual architecture can change based on a combination of things. One is its context, its image, or its location, such as, uh, say, Rancho Santa Fe, where they want to have a, um, you know, a, an architectural style that fits into their context, or it could be Texas, or it could be New England, or Kentucky. So all those are very different architectural, uh, a very different architectural context. But there are two things that I tried to, other than basically three things I pulled together to make that I describe as a makes a successful equestrian project. One is of course the health and safety of the horse. You're gonna you want to suit the needs of that. The other two is to suit the demands of the site, wherever it is. If it's in a desert location or a, a tropical climate, you want to you want to uh, adapt to those, uh, what I call the demands of the site, uh, and also the goals of the owner. For example, the goals of the owner may say, uh, for example, if you look in my book, the one in Pegaso uh, Farm in Chicago, that has a very different look than most barns. In fact, the owner said, I don't want your typical X bracing on your doors. I don't want your typical steep roof. I live in a prairie style Frank Lloyd Wright house. I like that style, and I would like my, uh, and it's popular in that area, which is north of Chicago. And so he he asked if we could design something to, at the same time, we could um, design a healthy and safe environment for his horses. It's so, really cool. I'm looking at pictures of it right now, and I would never have suspected that it was actually an equestrian facility. And if it wasn't on your website, and then, you know, you have the pictures in the inside, I have to say, though, for its contemporary styling, it's a very inviting facility. Like, it is. It makes you want to ride and, and work with horses in there. Were you surprised at that, at the finished product? I was. Uh, I had no idea. I was, uh, I was met with a challenge from the very beginning when he sort of hit me with that, and I said, no x bracing, perfect. I love it because I can't stand that. And I, he also said, I don't want any cupolas, which is fine. I don't like – I get tired of those because they're um, it's just sort of a cliché. But uh, and they don't really work, uh, but they look. They, you know, for an architectural look, it's, they're great, and they and uh, people like them, and we we incorporate them in the right place at the right time. But uh, so is a challenge, and I like that challenge. I like designing for different parts of the country and different environmental conditions, and and actually different owners' styles. Um, so you know, I I welcome that. It makes keeps it you know renews. Um, my, sort of my career focus all the time on every project when there's a different challenge with each one. Otherwise, some, one, someone asked me years ago, why don't I just, there's plenty of horses in the Mid-Atlantic, why don't I just stay in the Mid-Atlantic where it's simple and do farms right here? And I said, well, if I'd done that for 30 years, I'd probably be crazy now. Yeah. And plus, I wouldn't have enjoyed it. And I really enjoy traveling, designing for different environments. When I first did my project, for example, I did, used to do this in the early part of my career, I would go to Texas, for example, and I would never design my first farm in Texas. First thing I did on the way from the airport to the farm is I stopped in a shopping center, went to a bookstore, and I bought as many books and magazines about that area as I could just to learn about anything about barns, but certainly about the history and the context and what the look of, uh, the style. And so I, when I did design it, I um, I had that in sort of... Uh, in my background, and I collect books on barns, so I've, I'm pretty well knowledgeable about barns all over the country now. But then when I go onto the site and I see the owner's property or their house and how they've lived and how they're styled, that, that and it has a huge bearing on the design of the barn. So it all, it's a process that you come together, and I've uh, described it too. Many people get a prefab barn where you get the same barn basically anywhere in the country and it doesn't necessarily fit and that's why a lot of people don't like the prefab barns because they don't they want to have a little more custom look and uh similar is true when you get a design build barn many times that's a contractor who really has a sort of a uh a catalog of his own sort of styles and that's what they design whether it's uh it breaks any new ground or not and they just all they want to do is 
sell you a product, not really providing you a service. And so what we do is provide the service of designing something to fit the needs of the horse, the needs of the client, and the needs of the site, and come up with a different look, a different uh, facility every time uh, because of those three different elements, but it's always protecting the health and safety of the horse, and we never sacrifice that. I've walked away from about two or three projects in my career for where the owner wanted to do something that was just not healthy for horses, and I just said, it's not for me, and so we mutually split. Hmm. So what what are the let's say the top three? I know that that you've you know you light and airflow, but what would you say are the top three design functional design elements in a barn that are paramount to a horse's health? Well, I think uh, introducing like you know say having Dutch doors or vents along the low wall so you can bring air in low okay. on the outside and have control over that. And a Dutch door is a is a common element that works very well because you have opportunity of doing two things. You bring in light, light by opening the door. As that light, as the sun moves across the sky, that that light basically somewhat purifies the bedding of the stall, which reduces dampness, reduces darkness, and reduces odor. So you have a, a, a detail there. At, you're looking at the ventilation, and that is. And it's also ventilating vertically, so any of that odor and stuff is going vertically. So you use that element to control the ventilation. The ridge skylight is something I like because it's just like the Dutch door. It gives you an architectural element that gives rhythm to the length of a long barn. It looks great, gives it some scale. At the same time, the skylight on the roof uh, creates the chimney effect, which is what adds to our ventilation uh, uh, effect And that... Uh, and also gives you natural light, which reduces the need for lights during the day. And if you look at my barns, not you very few, unless we do have a loft, and we do an occasion have loss because the client requests it. But if you look at most of them, the lights aren't on during the day because they've got all natural light. It's better for the horse, just like if they were living outside. It's, it reduces odor. It um, and makes it a safer and lower cost operating facility. So that's, those are two elements. And I guess the third is just it comes down to more uh, one is uh, could be in uh, how you lay out the farm itself, which is also an important element because I'd say designing the barn is only half of it. Siting the barn and laying out the farm is just can be just as important as designing the barn. And uh, how you design that for health and safety, uh, the operation, whether it's uh, risk of injury to the horse or just uh, lower keeping the cost down. How you lay that out is is critical, and it's it's a it can it can have a huge impact on the operation of the farm. And I've described it before. Once I was at a farm to meet a farm manager in Lexington, and this is a farm we actually did. But this is before we designed it. I went to meet the farm manager, and I saw the the groom pointing to him out in the far distance of the fields and said. He's out there. He's on his way back to the barn. He was leading two horses back to the barn. And I waited probably, oh, at least 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes anyway, for him to get back to the barn. He said, great, nice to meet you. And he handed the two horses to the groom, turned around and said, I'll be back in about 20 minutes. He went out and get, to get two more horses from a small paddock in the distance to bring them back. And I thought, right there is at least 30 minutes wasted in the manager's time leading horses to and from distant paddocks. It's just how you lay out the farm, where the paddocks are, what roads they have to cross or don't have to cross, can have a huge impact on the man hours, the time, and the maintenance of the farm. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. Mm, I like them all. (laughs) I like them all. It's just there wouldn't be enough hours in a lifetime to, to have this much fun designing. Barnes. And, I, you know, it's funny because Jen and I were sort of connecting behind the scenes here, um, you know, that we, we had to wrap. It was it was time to go. But I'm like, all right, just one more question. And then I'm thinking sure. to myself, wait, no, I have another question. No, wait, I have like two more questions. Well, I could, you know, I could talk all day. In fact, I could write a book about it. In fact, <laughs> I've done that. I do. I'm going to ask you one more question. And but we, we kind of have to keep it brief. So, um one of the things I noticed on your website was that you do conversion. So you convert existing barns into residences. Yes. I would imagine that that is a boatload of fun. It is. 
It's I enjoy what I do with the horse farms, but I enjoy that too because I enjoy saving old buildings, particularly old old barns. Because one of the saddest sights that you can see driving down the road is an old barn that's collapsing because it's been just either the the operation has moved on, the farm is shut down, and it's just a, a wasted, a lost uh, sort of um, heritage of our country that we're losing thousands of barns all the time, yet there are still thousands out there. My concern is to protect them, to reuse them in a way, and reuse them in a way that's sympathetic of their original design, their original intent. And if you look at the barns that we've done, we've tried to do that. I've got several we're working on right now. And party barns, uh, different event centers, uh, places to have weddings, places to have parties, places for families to get together, because some of the farms we do are compounds where they have several family members living on the farm, but rather than have them all gather at one house, they gather in the party barn. And then they have meetings and business events and retreats and things like that. And, it, and they've been impre- incredibly popular. And so we're, as I said, we're doing several right now. I think I might have a conversion in my future. You do, you travel to Rhode Island, right? You go to Connecticut. Rhode Island's not far. I was just up there yesterday. Hey, wait a minute, Helena. What? what? Yeah, I don't. Right. I don't know that you can make your house into a barn. It's a very small house. No, no, no. I want to go and find. <laughs> I want to go and find a new barn. I mean, a new old barn, and make that the house, and then build a party barn for my horses. Ah. Uh. Well, there have... you go. That's the other point I want to make in designing the barns is, a lot of people will design a barn for, uh, and you can for the ease and operation, the health and safety of the horse. But the other aspect. For the, that sort of meets the program needs of the owner that they may not recognize is that you will spend a lot of time in that barn. You'll spend a lot of time with your horse, but very little time actually riding the horse comparatively. So I think the social elements of how you design a farm or a barn to create areas where you can enjoy your, the people you're with, enjoy your horses, and focus on what you're interested in and your passion, but you may not be riding the horse. So you got to create those spaces whether it's a, a group of pack and wash dolls, where it's a tack room, where it's a lounge, where whatever it is, a uh, place indoors or place outdoors, places where you can gather uh, with your friends and your horses and enjoy them. And that is an important feature of every certainly private barn. It's not so much part of thoroughbred farms, but when you get to the more private farms, that is an important feature to consider, and that's what we try to incorporate in every farm we do. Well, we, I can tell you that part of having horses at home is not just enjoying them, but entertaining them because we use our barn aisle way for pogoing, pogo sticking, hula hooping, (laughs) dancing, coffee, talking, and general shenanigans. And it's very entertaining to the horses. So I could not agree with you more about using that space for more than just grooming, tacking up and riding. Barns are a great place to have parties. (laughs) <laughs> That's you're preaching to the choir, buddy. Well, yes. thank you, John Blackburn, once again for joining us on Stable Scoop. Tell us where people can get um, your new book. Well, I think you can buy it online. Um, I'm doing I do book events, uh, but most bookstores have them, and uh, Amazon, different places have them. But uh, they aren't donating them to any of their profits to uh, horse charities. And when I do an event, I a private event I go through and I will take books and I sell the books and all the profits go to horse charities. So uh, all the proceeds go to horse charities. So, but you can go to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, various, and your local bookstore, your, um, especially if it's a, a tax shop that may handle some books and, uh, they can probably get the book, but, uh, there's various sources you can get them. Excellent. And it's Healthy Stables by Design, a common sense approach to the health and safety of horses. Well, my goodness, I think I could have picked bra- picked John's brains for quite a lot longer. Can you imagine if we had like time with this guy in person? Yeah. On a job site? Yeah. <laughs> If we ever see, if we ever see him at a horse show, look out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or right, right or in front of a great big whiteboard. I don't know what <gasps> architects use to like brainstorm about design. Wouldn't that but be you fun? give me like a bright red marker, a whiteboard, and John Blackburn, you won't see me for months. <laughs> yeah. If 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 you are ever uh, housebound because of a blizzard, 
All you do is you take out his book and a notebook and a pencil, and you can entertain yourself for hours. Mm. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't like to sit and doodle and create dream barns? Who doesn't like to love to do that? I know. It's like building forts. It's like designing forts. Yeah. Sparkle and Boom is a new media marketing company. Our mission is to help small businesses add some sparkle to their marketing in order to get some boom in their bottom line. Our creativity, combined with an extensive background in the equestrian industry, makes us perfectly suited to help your business capture the potential of social media and the ever-changing World Wide Web. Visit us online at www.sparkleandboom.com. We've got some other cool stuff to hear about today. Uh, the adventure in horsemanship that is Road to the Horse. We've got a little recorded interview that Glenn and Tammy did with the 2014 Road to the Horse champion, Jim Anderson. So let's tune in right now. Howdy, Tammy. Hi, Glenn. I'm like, whooped. Road to the Horse was so long for me. <laughs> I'm so tired, but, but it turned out wonderful as always. It was so good. We're, this is going to be our wrap-up show. That's the reason t- I'm on the show instead of Alan, because I, I was there. I was at Road to the Horse and got to see the whole thing. So Tammy and I are going to sort of do our, our Road to the Horse wrap-up here, and we're going to have the winner on with us a little bit later, right? Yep, yep. Uh, Jim Anderson from Canada. Uh, got lots of new fans now he has. Yes, lots of new people <laughs> know his name. Well, and a lot of Canadian fans. There were a lot of Canadians there rooting for him this weekend. Uh, it was it was neat to see all of them down with their signs. Canadians can make signs too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they can, and I think they were already there with Jim, uh, Jim, with uh, Jonathan Fields supporting him. So the Canadians they kind of lucked out. They had uh, two on the home team there with Jonathan Field and. Jim Anderson. Well, let's explain what happened from the beginning of the weekend. What, what basically happened is we had six wild cards that came in. Ultimately, there were six uh, that came in. They had had the horses from last year at Road to the Horse. They had picked out of the Remuda and took their horses home. And they were able to train them up for a year and then bring them back and do a bit of a competition, which was a lot of fun on Thursday. And the winner of that then went on to compete with the others in the main competition. What did you think of the wild card competition? I loved it. It's kind of like a Remuda makeover, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> who, who can do the most a in four, a four sixes and... quarter horse makeover. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what it was. I loved it. I really loved the freestyle. And I really loved how each competitor's horse kind of adapted a little bit of their personality. You know, you had... Mary Kitzmiller, who was very, um, I don't want to say English orientated, but um, had a lot of freestyle to do, um, which was a lot of lead changes and a lot of uh, lateral movements. And then you had Adam Tarpley, who was a ranch uh, hand and was kind of more focused on cow work and making that horse a great ranch horse. And so all these horses kind of went off in almost different directions and they all came back together and they were all amazing. Every single one of them, I thought, had done a phenomenal job. They really had, and you know, they really only had a year. And the obstacle mm-hmm. course that they had to do was difficult. I mean, you know, a lot of the people right now. Uh, this is what I heard the most in the stands this uh-huh. weekend was, "My horse couldn't do that." <laughs> <laughs> and you know they probably had that horse for ten years, you know. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of people sitting around going, "My horse couldn't do that," you know. <laughs> yep. And these yep. horses were doing it either after a year, and then in the main competition they were doing it after five hours of training. So I know that was yes. the biggest part. I think in what I was listening to in the audience is people saying that. My so the do that. wild cards, yeah, they all look great. I got to make some friends this weekend. Adam, uh, at you, you, who you just mentioned, I got yep. to meet him and his wife Shorty, and and spent the weekend. I actually, sat on the airplane with his mother in law on the way home to Florida. Oh, really? She was on the airplane on the way home. Sat right beside her. We we had a great time talking about the weekend. It was the shortest flight to Florida I've ever had. Um, so got, and they were such lovely people and it's just, you know, the people who are, you know, for the most part, like Adam and, and all the wild cards and things, they're just people out there that actually do use their horses for a living. 
you know, a lot of them work on ranches and, you know, a lot of them compete and, and they live that life, uh, that ranch life. And, and that's what's so cool about chatting with them and talking to them. And, and, you know, they're just real wholesome, good people. They really are. And I think one of my favorite uh, times, Glenn, I went out Sunday morning uh, church and Mary Kitzmiller and Sean Patrick had both of their horses at the front door of the uh, arena welcoming people as they came. And these these wild cards, they were real people. They were people you could sit and have a coffee with or talk about horses or they were so people friendly. You know, I don't know if that's the right term, but having them as part of the audience and someone who's very, very approachable. I think the fans really enjoyed that. Yes, I agree. And, and they were, they were very accessible all weekend long. They mm-hmm. really were. They, they, uh, they were very accessible. So it was, uh, that, that my impressions were this, uh, I was and it, it's much the same thing as you said from last year. Now I'm a horse husband, you know, I drive, I drive horses, I am not what I would consider a horseman in any way, shape, or form. My wife is. Uh, but I, I found it absolutely fascinating. And I wasn't sure. You know, walking, going into it, I heard what you had said about your first experience last year and how passionate you were about it. Mm-hmm. And so I went in with a really open mind, and I watched the whole entire thing. I watched the wild cards. I watched every session of the training that they did with these horses, and I was absolutely fascinated. I didn't think that sitting there watching five hours of training would be exciting, (laughs) you know, because they're basically four guys in round pens with horses. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I was totally enamored by the whole thing just because you could see the personalities coming out so quickly of Mm -hmm. of the clinicians and the horses, for that matter. Yeah, Um, both. Yeah, both. But it was amazing to watch the progress that the horse I, I thought on day one, I thought actually Antoine had it had probably one of the best quietest horses. And mm-hmm. by day two, he wasn't so quiet anymore. And he, <laughs> it turned out to not be one of the best horses to work with. So, you know, it was really interesting to watch that change over that period of time in these horses. It really was. And after the event each day, I was very fortunate to go and attend a press conference where we would talk to the competitors and the wild cards. And I was there um, with some magazines, and they asked the question to these wild cards of, of, tell us about the relationship with your horse. And I remember in a magazine asking that of Sean Patrick, and he looked up and he said, he's my best friend. And it wasn't a horse training contest. It was, it was, it was an exhibition of relationships to me. It was these wild cards, they love these horses. And that is so obvious with our winner, Jim Anderson. But all the wild cards have these amazing relationships with these horses. And that's what I think made it so special. When you watch Jim Anderson out there working his wild card horse, Maverick, you could see the love that he has for that horse. And I think that's what made it so passionate. I agree. I agree. And not to mention Tootie puts on a good show. Oh yeah, I, I, we have <laughs> it's always to, a good show. We have to talk really quickly about uh, about the uh, the fire in the arena. I, I have never seen that done before, and you can find video of it. I'm sure uh, it's not even on your road to the horse page. But but they basically poured kerosene, must have been kerosene, down on the on the arena floor under the sand and made the road to the horse R T T H mm-hmm. symbol out of fire with a darkened arena, just lit it on fire. And then they had these guys going around with fire whips. And then they had, I had another new friend of mine down in the arena there, Ellie O'Brien doing the fire sparkler thing. (laughs) It was Mm -hmm. just an incredible thing to watch. Although I think they learned a valuable lesson. You have to drag the arena after because (laughs) none of the horses went across the black lines that are left in the arena after the fire. I think there was a valuable lesson learned there. (laughs) No, that was pretty cool. And I think the, uh, opening ceremony where Dan James um, had made a uh, grand piano platform yes. and jumped his horse <laughs> on top of the piano with somebody um, playing the piano, you know. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that was that was pretty cool. You know, I, I love that, and there's lots of photos of that on uh, Double Dan Horsemanship Facebook. But uh, yeah, everything was exciting, and I, I think though this is a different kind of audience, Glenn. These. These aren't, someone told me, they quoted and they said, these aren't drink the Kool-Aid people. Um, And they're not. These people 
they love the horse. The fans love the horse. And I think that's why they appreciate the relationship so much. It is just a phenomenal group of people. Well, and they understand it because they were noticing the little tiny nuances. When 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 a horse's light bulb would go on, mm-hmm. they got it where somebody that didn't know anything about horses or had never dealt with horses before. I'm sure somebody that de- has never dealt with horses before sits there and goes, don't horses just do this? You know, they all think that we get on, we ride, they can do anything, and you have nothing to do with it as a rider. That's what mm-hmm. non-horsey people think. And I'm sure sitting here watching this, they would be they would be going, oh, what's the big deal? You know, whereas, you know, so you truly do have to have a horse crowd there. Yes, yeah. yes, you do, you do. And you could hear all the audience. They were, they were the most helpful audience, weren't they, Glenn? Oh, geez. <laughs> if somebody was doing something wrong in the obstacle course, they were telling them about it. <laughs> yes, yes, all 8,000 of them. <laughs> <laughs> that was neat. By the way, the venue, I think, was perfect. I think the Kentucky Horse Park works great. The shopping was good. I actually spent some money, too, over the weekend. I did, too. My credit card, actually, was so bent, I had to take... <laughs> Half of it with with uh, tape, and uh, and I still had the little magnetic code that was the main thing, you know. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my credit card took a beating there, Glenn. Yeah, there were a lot of people's credit card took beatings. I saw a lot of bags walking around. I, I really <laughs> did. And you know, a couple of your sponsors were there too, and I was fascinated by this. Wasn't your the custom ha- hat people? Wasn't that one of yours? Yeah. Yes, that one of my sponsors, J.W. Brooks, love, love, love his hats. Now, they were at the end there, right? They're the ones that were at yep. the end. And they were at the end. Under they the were LED doing board custom there. hat fittings, which I watched an entire one of with that fancy contraption the thing they put in your head. Yeah, the little wooden box thing. Yeah, and I had never seen that done before. So, And then they had that metal thing that has all the little pokey things that makes the head shape. Um, yes, yes. You have a brand new appreciation for the Western world, don't you, Glenn? <laughs> I have an appreciation for those hats cost a lot of money. I was like going, oh my God. That's why I have a sponsorship. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't think I, I didn't pay as much for my harness that I just bought as those hats cost. Uh, It was, it's it's a, it's a personality statement. The Western people are, you know, it's all about character, Glenn. And I did see a lot of personality statements over the weekend too. (laughs) (laughs) There was a lot of that as well. It was fun. It was a good time. I made a lot of new friends. And, you know, coming from the English side, I had never really seen anything like that before. So, uh, you know, what's interesting, too, is talking to a lot of my English friends who had never heard of it. I (laughs) think they would appreciate it, too. I think if they would just come out and watch, they would appreciate it because they appreciate the horse and those little things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Anyone who loves the horse, it doesn't matter what tack you ride in, I think, if you can see the relationship someone has with that horse, you know, that's that's what inspires you and that's what really moves you, I think, regardless of what discipline you come from. Well, let's have a chat with the winner of A Road to the Horse 2014, wild card winner and the main winner. I don't just know just the winner of everything. Uh, he just won everything. Fan Took favorite, all the money. Too, yeah, fan favorite. Took all the money, all the prizes and left. All the and saddles. Now he's leaving the country and the and uh well we'll find leaving the country exactly (laughs) (laughs) and we'll find out if he's ever coming back and on the line with us we have the 2014 world champion jim anderson from road to the horse good morning jim good morning how are you guys we're great we're great have you came off your 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 cloud of of winning the entire event not only the ram wild card but the actual entire road to the horse event Yes, yes, it's all starting to settle in now, I guess, yes. <laughs> You've got to be so proud of Maverick. Maverick, you picked out of the remuter in 2013. He's the one that took you into the round pan from the wildcat competition, and he's just, the work that you've done with that horse in only 12 months is phenomenal, and you've got to be proud of him. Oh, yes, I mean, I'm really proud of him. I mean, I love that horse, uh, he is just one of those type of horses that, uh, when it comes to just competition, he just puts an extra his extra heart in there and really comes through all the time for me. So tell us a little bit about his personality. Is Maverick kind of standoffish? Does he want to be your best friend, or what kind of relationship do you have with Maverick? Uh, he's. I mean, he's a really nice guy. I mean, he's the type of guy that, I mean, he'd be out in the paddock there and i walk out there and he trots up to me and uh 
I can lead him to the barn without a halter on him. So he's pretty hooked on me. I got to tell you, it was fun. This was my first road to the horse, actually going and watching it. I watched every minute of the whole thing from the wild card on. And you know, you could t- it was interesting watching the wild cards as they came in and, and you guys did your thing. And, you know, right away after you were done, I said, he's going to win this thing because you were so good at at not only Maverick becoming the crowd favorite, but you becoming the crowd favorite. I think that 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 really has a lot to do with it when it comes to the wild card competition. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh, I mean, Maverick, he uh, really helped. Everybody, uh, everybody loved him. He just come in and he was just so nice about everything. He just really tried. Even if he wasn't sure about something, he still really tried really good. When you were driving to Road to the Horse, Jim, could you see yourself in the round pen? I mean, is, is that ultimately, did you think it was possible that a wild card could come in and win the entire event? Well, you know, we really practiced for the round pen. I did some demos back home. Uh, so I really knew how to manage the time in the round pan and and do that. So uh, I never like to count my ticks before my hat before they're hat, <laughs> but I definitely prepared for it. Jim, I have an interesting question. So you 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 win the wild card, and then you're you're thrown in you, you're thrown into the middle of the remuda, and you pick your horse, and and um you know you picked an amazing horse. It turns out, uh, but when at what point during that? over three days, five hours of training, at what point do you go, okay, you know, I'm connecting with this one? How long does it take to get to that point where the light bulb goes on for you and the horse? I took about 10 minutes. I mean, uh, once <laughs> I got my hands on him and I got that halter on him and uh, we started, you know, playing back and forth and kind of getting some understanding, uh, it was about 10 minutes in to once I had that halter on him, uh, that, you know, we started getting some communication there. So, Jim, I heard a little rumor that your wife picked your horse out of the Bermuda. Is that true? Well, my wife and my pen wrangler did pick my horse out, yes. <laughs> uh, there was lots going on in the road to the horse, and uh, in the morning is when the Bermuda would come into the arena, and I needed sleep, so uh, Dylan and Andrea both got up and went out at 6 o'clock in the morning and watched the horses and picked them out, yes. They gave me the sheet of paper and had to draw which horses to pick. <laughs> so I, I actually was lucky enough to watch the Remuda get exercised early in the morning, and that little grueler, when they put the spotlights on, he was the first one to chase those spotlights around on the ground. He was so curious, and he was so inquisitive and so brave, and is that why he was her first pick? Well, he was, you know, I mean, Dylan and Andrea, I mean, both are really know how to read a horse. And he was very much a leader and he was very, very much confident in, in himself and dominant. So he was going to take the obstacles well, you know, just because he could take that spotlight and different stuff. But mm-hmm. in that, you always have the dominance there. And he tried to be a little dominance over me which I knew that, but we also knew I could get riding them quick. So that was a big thing is to be able to get on them quick. And didn't you pick a horse, if I remember right, that the others wanted too? You just got lucky enough to pick him first? Uh, you bet. I think everybody <laughs> likes the gorilla. So, yeah. So yeah. I just had a good draw, you bet. Yeah. That helps. <laughs> yeah, it does, yes. It never hurts. Antoine is the one that ended up with a tough horse. Uh, you know, watching the whole the whole weekend, he just that horse yep. just had, was tough with him the whole weekend. Yep. That horse is actually headed back to Switzerland, Glenn. Really, he ended up buying it. Mm-hmm. Yep, oh, wow. he ended up buying that horse. He had a phenomenal obstacle course and uh, went ahead and bought that horse and uh, is going to ship him to Switzerland. He became uh, he he became a crowd favorite when he got that horse that he had had trouble with all weekend to actually even do the obstacle course, let alone <laughs> do it well. You know, um, that that takes he some did horsemanship. Amazing in the obstacle course, yeah, yeah, he really did. So, Jim, you have purchased Smokey, your Grula horse, and he's with you right now. He is, yes, and he's riding really nice. Uh, we've rode him outside here and over some obstacles and. And he's coming really well. He's starting to stop and starting to turn around a little bit. So uh, he's definitely on the road to success. 
And have you ridden them in your brand new saddle, or is that thing being mounted somewhere <laughs> in a glass case? I think we're just going to leave the saddle in the house is what we're going to do. <laughs> you worked hard for that for a whole year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So and- what's your plans with Smokey? Are you going to do some reining with him, more of an obstacle kind of horse? Uh, you know, I, I really want to uh, do really similar to what I did with Maverick. I would like to do some some reining with him, some obstacle course. I'd like to do some liberty with him. Just get him to be really an all-round really nice horse. Jim, you were on a different radio show uh, yesterday or the day before, and uh, somebody popped in. Tell us about that that you were not expecting. Yes, it was it was a very nice ex- <laughs> very nice somebody popping in is I got invited back by Tootie, which I mean is just amazing and I was just thrilled and honored to be invited back next year. So that really made my day. You mean you don't have to do a wild card to qualify next year? <laughs> no, not next year. I guess not, yes. <laughs> It's going to seem you'll have so a lot more uh, yeah, weight on your shoulders next yeah, year. Yeah, it's going to seem so easy for you. You're going to show up. You don't have to do anything on Thursday. You can just hang around, drink watch beer. The yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, I'll be able to watch the review this year. Yes. <laughs> well, congratulations. It was it was a pleasure watching you all weekend. It was a pleasure watching everybody. I mean, everybody had their own challenges and and their their own things that happened. You had some good competition this year. And it it, yes. cer- it certainly came down to the wire. And you you unlike other years, like when Guy was in last year, he wasn't really leading, and you know up till the final up till the final obstacle course, you had kind of you were steady all weekend. I think that really meant a lot to the judges. Yeah, I mean the competition was great. I mean all of the clinicians were just really good hands out there, so it was really nice to compete with them and. You know, I just kind of stayed with my program and kind of with my goals each day. And, uh, yeah, it, it turned out really well. I was really happy. I do have a que- question, Tammy. One, one more to follow up on that one. You know, yeah. there was some alluding over the weekend, and I know you guys hang out together and you all know each other. And you, if you don't know each other personally, you know of reputations. Do you actually discuss what happened that day? You know, when you're at the day one, do you talk about your horses and things with each other? Or do you pretty much keep that quiet? Oh, you know, the group was a really good group. I mean, Dan Steers and Antoine and Jonathan, they're all really nice guys. So, you know, we kept it light, but definitely, you know, we always asked what they thought of the day and what, how they felt with their horses, and they asked the same. And, and so it was really nice that uh, the camaraderie was really good between all of us. Yeah, it was good. So I've just got to ask, Tim, when you were going through the obstacle course, was there one obstacle that you were dreading? You were just like, oh, man, I hope I get through this. Uh, not really, I guess. You know, uh, I'm just the type of person, just one thing at a time. So, uh, yeah, no, I I thought uh, we would be able to go through everything. I wasn't too worried. I guess it was the drag that really caused the most problems <laughs> that day. I laughed when Antoine called it a big tick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, that probably was, you know, and it showed to be uh, probably the most challenging one was the drag with that stuff on it, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you in, in uh, 2015, Jim, and there's a $100,000 purse next year. That's got to be exciting. Oh, yes, I'm thrilled. I was thrilled and honored to be in the competition this year, and I'm even more honored to be invited <laughs> back next year, so... I'm really happy. They were one year too late on that hundred grand, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that would make paying paying the gas bill a little easier. But this is going to, and then next year, I'm really excited too. I mean, this is the first competition I know of that's going to include three members of the audience, and they have a chance to win ten thousand dollars too. I mean, that is a cool idea. That is really yeah. Neat. That's an awesome idea. Yep. Yep. So you're going to have a helper next year, whether you want it or not. So. Yes, well, I'll have two. I'll have two pen wranglers. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You just better hope it's you not bet. me, because uh, that'd be bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Good. Have a You're great trip welcome. home. 
Great to chat with you, Thank Jim. Thank you for Congratulations. The show. All right. Well, that is it, I think. For That's it. the full scoop. That's my we, new thing. It's the full <laughs> scoop. That's the full scoop. Don't forget to, the, to get the Horse Radio Network app on iOS or Android by searching for Horse Radio Network in the App Store. It is free and easy to use. For details about today's show, you can go to stablescoop.com where we will put links, photos, and more information about today's guests. We love your feedback, so please be sure to follow us on Facebook under Stable Scoop and Chat Away. We're also on Twitter at Horse Radio. And many thanks to our sponsor, Kentucky Performance Products, and listeners like you. And you can find KPP products at kppusa.com or walk into your local feed store and say, I'm looking for Kentucky Performance Products, and they will get them for you if they're not already on the shelves. And if you go to stablescoop.com, look for the big banner in the center that says Become an Auditor, and you can support the Horse Radio Network shows and become an auditor and have some extra benefits, too. For as little as a dollar a month. A buck a month. Help we can out. afford that. That's yep. right. So don't forget to visit all the great shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. And that is indeed the full scoop for the week, Jen. But there will be more next week. Thanks for joining me. As always, it's a pleasure. <laughs>